Well, good morning, friends. Welcome back to the teaching and preaching ministry of Mohican Church. My name is Pastor Paul Bartholomew. It's great to have you with us this morning. So thank you so much for tuning in. Last week, uh, you know, leading into Thanksgiving week, we spent uh, time taking a look at, you know, indeed, God has done great things. And uh, you may recall, if you saw that video, you may recall that I was absolutely so excited to think about the fact that, you know, this year all of Advent fits into December. And so we get really an extra week to take a look at Thanksgiving, the gratitude in our hearts. Uh, last week, because of what God has done, you know, indeed, the, the fields are, uh, the fields were bountiful and the harvest is in, uh, most of it. Um, we know that, uh, that God has put food on our plates, He has put a roof over our heads, he has, he has given us so many good things. And for those things, we give thanks. But today we're going to take a look, actually in Psalm 103, taking a look at thanking God for who He is. And so, join me if you would in a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive right into it. Psalm 103 is where we'll be in just a moment. But let's pray. Father God, we do thank you that we have the opportunity to come in your presence this morning. Once again, Lord, to gather before you. Lord, while we are still reflecting on, uh, on the bounty, on the goodness uh, that you have shown us, the things that you have done for us, uh, that, that which you have done to us, ultimately, um, Lord, the life that you have given us in Jesus Christ. I mean, when we think about what you've done, it, you're amazing, God. If you simply gave us Jesus and nothing else, then, then we would have been most incredibly blessed. But God, you did. You have filled our pantries. You have filled our bellies. You have given us warmth and comfort. You have given us, um, Lord, so many good things. So many good things. Indeed, were we to try to tell of all your wonderful deeds, well, then, Lord, we would, uh, we would be talking until you call us home. But um, for God, you are good. And so we thank you. We thank you, Father, for Thanksgiving past. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to have sat down with our families, with our friends, to enjoy, uh, to enjoy uh, just a, a sample of your many blessings to us as we gathered around the table with our loved ones. But God, as we continue in Thanksgiving this morning, as we continue in this attitude of gratitude, as it's sometimes called, then, then Father, I pray that, uh, that indeed our eyes might be fixed upon you. I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be ready through your Holy Spirit to receive humbly the word that you've got for us. And God, I pray that ultimately it would result in, uh, Lord, causing our joy, our thanksgiving, to overflow to your praise and glory. Oh, and Father, God, as, as we prepare uh, to dive into your word, Lord, I, I am mindful that there are those uh, for whom this has been a very hard holiday. Perhaps the first one, when somebody that they loved was not around the table, uh, Lord, perhaps... Um, difficulties um, at work or with work or perhaps um, you know a sudden lack of work whatever it might be God we know that there there are those who would say okay hold on I'm not ready quite so ready to to celebrate all that I have because I don't have much well then God I pray especially there Lord that that those hearts that those hearts Lord would would turn to your word today in an attitude of anticipation that, okay, well, so maybe I'm not sitting in the lap of luxury, at least from my perspective. Then God, help us to understand the gift of who you are, your great love to us, and, and help us, God, have the grace to return thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, this morning, so we're going to be in Psalm 103, and it's really tough I have to tell you before we get started, and, uh, and it's really tough to pick a passage to talk about the goodness of God as far as because of who He is, we will praise Him. 
But, um, but I've chosen Psalm 103. It's an absolute beaut. Uh, and I would encourage you there that, uh, that as we go there, well, then may we indeed enter into it with a, with a spirit of thanksgiving in our hearts because he is good. Amen? All right. Well, here we go. So Psalm 103 begins like this. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, bless his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. And the wind blows over it, and it is gone. It remembers its place no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, his kingdom rules over all. And so praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion, Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And so as we gather this morning, and I have to tell you, at least in its present form, at the time of this recording, I have to tell you that the PowerPoint isn't that great today. Uh, <laughs> I just think it's important to be honest. Uh, so if you were to go, uh, if you pull up this PowerPoint, you're going to be like, uh, that's it. Wow, man, you went all out on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, I hesitated even making one because of the nature of it. But if you have the opportunity and you so desire where you found this sermon uh, online, you can also find the, the PowerPoint. Uh, but, but, but I acknowledge that it's not the most helpful one that I've ever done. Okay? So, anyway, but let's get back to God. For He is great and He is worthy to be praised. And so the, the psalmist begins, David begins, so praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, bless his holy name, or praise his holy name. And so the moment that David unpacks this psalm, he just opens up his heart, and he's like, praise the Lord. And so if we're going to acknowledge who God is, then, then we start right here. And, and the, the, the term Lord there, it's the term which we understand throughout the Old Testament is Yahweh. That he is the one true God, that he is Jehovah, that he is, um, and, and so many titles are given to him. And I was quite honestly tempted, and that's a terrible word, but I had considered using uh, this morning to actually just to, to lift up the names of God, his many attributes. We're not going to go there, but to start this out, David says, well, let's be clear. You are Jehovah God, that you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that you are the Lord, our provider, that you are God most high, that you are the Lord God Almighty. You are Jehovah. There is none like you. There is no one higher to whom we can appeal. And so David immediately, he opens this up 
And, and then he says, praise his holy name. God is holy. Even his name is holy. Even his name is set apart. And there is indeed no one like him. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. David it, it is, is desiring, he says, no, I want my soul, I want it to be fixed on the Lord who alone is holy, who alone is worthy of praise and glory. And so praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all oh my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And I, I love that, by the way. By the way, notice what David is saying. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He's not talking about, can I just get my lips to say, thank you, God? Can I just, you know, can I muster up somehow for my lips to come up with the words, I'm grateful. That's not what he's talking about. David says, no, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I want it to come from the depth of who I am. Not simply lip service, because by the way, the Father who is in heaven, he is so very aware of a heart that is sincere versus um, just simply the service of our lips, all right? And so, so God knows that, but David says, no, listen, when I'm looking at God, when I understand who Yahweh is, when I understand His majesty, His holiness, when I look at the wonder of who He is, then, then I want my soul engaged in this. Not simply the words of my mouth. I, and have you ever been there? I mean, in your prayer time, when you find yourself just blah, 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 and, and you're, you're not really there. Right? David said, no, I want my soul engaged. The heart of who I am, because he is worthy of it all. So praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all of his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. And so, so we understand that, that he is not only Jehovah, not only Yahweh, we understand that he is holy, but we understand that he is, that God is our benefactor. Now the Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift, in the book of James, every good and perfect gift comes from above. From the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows, right? So he is our benefactor. He is the one who... Well, as we're going to see in a moment, satisfies our desires. We'll get to that, so I don't want to run ahead. But he is our benefactor. He is the one who has poured out such amazing grace upon us in so many ways. We looked at a lot of those last week, so I'm going to resist the urge to, to just plunge into that again this morning. But he is our benefactor. Forget not all his benefits. And then David goes on, actually, to unpack some of those for us in case we have forgotten. He forgives all your sins. Well, let's be clear. He forgives those which we confess. Okay? Uh, so if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is just. He'll forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, but, but God is the one. If our sins will be forgiven... It is the God who is the righteous judge. It is the God who is uh, who stands uh, holy, who reigns supreme. It is God who is our forgiver. And how beautiful, we've talked about before, but how beautiful to know that, that we find such grace, such mercy in the one whom we have offended. Have you experienced the forgiveness of God? Well, then give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Then give thanks. He forgives all your sins. He heals your diseases. One of the titles given to, to the Father in Scripture is that he is the God who heals. And I, I so love that title, he is the God who heals. And so the confidence that that, that, that stirs up within us when, when we look You've known broken bodies, haven't you? 
I mean, you've experienced it. If not in your life, perhaps you're listening to this and say, no, actually, right now, to this point, everything in my life has come up roses. Well, maybe it's been with family members where you've experienced long periods of, of illness, sickness, disease. Maybe you've struggled there. God is the healer. God is the healer. And, and so we have this incredible God who heals to whom we can appeal. I do not believe, by the way, that miraculous healings were simply a thing of the past, as some do. I do believe that God this day, for purposes uh, that or for in, in ways that will fulfill his purposes, his plans for his glory, God still heals today. And so I, I want to be quick to ask for that healing every time for those that I love. Uh, because he is the God who heals, he restores, he makes new. If you look down into to verse 4, he redeems your life from the pit. He is a redeemer. Hey, listen, we talked last week about it is vitally important that we don't live in the past, okay? That we don't just... Uh, that we don't just, you know, that we're not constantly thinking about, man, it sure was good in the old days. That's actually what got Lot's wife in trouble. But that we would, that we would instead be looking ahead uh, toward the future, pressing on, running the race with perseverance that God has laid out for us. But, but that, that we do remember with deep gratitude that from which God has brought us. And, and we see that, by the way, throughout the scriptures. Uh, not only, we're told in the, in, the, in the scriptures that, hey, these things were written down as warnings, but the Bible doesn't just include warnings, does it? It doesn't just include warnings. It actually uh, has a lot of things in there that says, no, look back, look at the faithfulness of God, look at the deliverance of God, look at the compassion of God, look at his great love. Uh, and, and so when we look at this, he redeems your life from the pit. Do you remember where he was? Or, <laughs> do you remember where you were when he found you? Do you remember where you were when he found you? Uh, do you remember where you were? And I don't just mean in body, but perhaps for some of you, uh, physically, you were in a bad place when he found you. But do you remember where you were emotionally? Do you remember where you were mentally? Uh, do you remember where you were spiritually when he found you? He's redeemed our life from the pit. He is the redeemer. He is worthy of our praise. Friends, remember his works and give thanks. He redeems your life from the pit. You, by the way, uh, you know, I know that there are those who, who might have called that pit at that time in their lives, they might have called that pit the penthouse, right? That they had, that they had arrived, right? that they were just living, they, they had the world by the tail, so to speak. Well, the Bible calls it as it was. When he found you, uh, you were in the pit. When he found me, we were in, I was in the pit, desperately needing redemption, and, and God the Father did that with the blood of his own son. So let's press on. He crowns you with love and compassion. He just pours out his love and compassion upon you. He's the gracious judge. I mean, think about this. He redeemed your life from the pit. It's not like he looked at you and said, ooh, 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 wow, wow, I'm going to keep this one just like it is. He didn't do that. He redeemed you. He redeemed me. And then it says he he crowned us with love and compassion. He poured out upon us. He placed upon our heads his great love and his compassion when he had found us in the pit. I mean, he, he, he's finding treasures in the trash heaps, isn't he? And then he crowns with love and compassion. What an incredibly gracious judge the Father is. He is the satisfier of our souls. Verse 5. He satisfies our desires with good things. 
the satisfier of our souls. Now, does that mean that he always gives us what we're asking for? He certainly doesn't. Because sometimes we're asking amiss. Sometimes we're asking, you know, things for, uh, that things would work out for our good and not according to his plan, not for his glory, but things that would, uh, that would feel good to us. Well, he satisfies our desires with good things. And I think it's so very important, you know, we look at that, he satisfies our desires with that which is good. What a gracious God, that he doesn't always give us the things that we think we want, but that he gives us that which is good, and in so, in him, is the satisfaction of our souls. We... There used to be a song when I was growing up uh, that, that says, I still haven't found what I'm, what I'm looking for. Still haven't found what I'm looking for. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, St. Augustine, Augustine, uh, was it Augustine? Shoot. I don't think it was Augustine at all. And I forgot to look that up. And if you wonder if I'm embarrassed right now, yes, I am. But, uh, so you can, you can do a search, a quick search, that said, in essence, uh, Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are forever restless until they find their rest in thee. God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are forever restless until they find their rest in thee. And that is so true. Until we come to the satisfier of our souls, we're going to be a restless lot. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be chasing after the wind, so to speak, because he is our satisfaction. He satisfies our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Uh, friends, he is the restorer. He is the restorer. Now think about it, I mean, he knows. He created us in his image. He created us for his glory. He designed us with plans and purpose. And he is the God who restores, having found us in the pit, so to speak. He is the God who restores us. And, and so have you ever looked at your life and said, wow, you know, I'm a long way from where I need to be. But praise God, I'm a long way from where I used to be. He's the restorer of our souls. He satisfies our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed. When we were trying to satisfy our desires with things that were not good, it was aging us. It was aging us. It was wearing us out mentally. It was wearing us out spiritually. Perhaps wearing us out physically in that time when we were trying to satisfy our desires with things that were not good. He says, no, listen, I'm going to satisfy. You'll find your satisfaction in me with good things, and you're going to find yourself restored. I just so love that, uh, that we serve a God who is the restorer of our souls. Verse 6 goes on to remind us that he is righteous and that he is just. There is no shadow of turning in him. Uh, that, that he is holy, he is pure, he, his ways are right, and he is working righteousness. He is working, he is bringing a sense of right to all those who are oppressed. And, and he is just. And so, so those, and I do know that these days, many of us are living in, in, uh, in quite a bit of comfort. But I also notice these days that there are a whole lot of folk who are living under oppression and, and God the righteous judge, he, he sees, he knows. And he is working righteousness and justice for the oppressed. And so friends, if you find yourself in a place of oppression, I would encourage you to lift up your eyes. Allow the one who is described in the Psalms as the lifter of my head allow the lifter of our heads to, to, to just kind of gently as a, as a father and say, okay, hold on, wait, 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 look, look at me. Allow the father to be the lifter of your head. 
In verse 7, he is, it says, He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. He is a God who is not, is not hiding from us. He is a God who is not aloof. He is not at a distance. He reveals his plan to his people, to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. He revealed himself. He is not a God who is hidden from us. He is not a God who is impersonal, who is a way up there, but, but we see the personal nature of his love, the personal nature, the, that part of his character, that he is such a, a personal and intimate God. I mean, we saw that with the sending of his son, that, that the word became flesh and lived for a while among us, that God came near in the person of Jesus Christ. In the one who is called Emmanuel, God came near. He is an intimate and personal God. In verse 8, we're reminded that he is compassionate and that he is gracious. Compassion means to suffer with, right? And so, so when the Father sees us in our lost condition, when he sees us struggling, he is a God who, is, who suffers with us in that sense. I want to encourage you, not right now, uh, perhaps, but if you have a chance to turn over to Luke 15 and you'll learn more in the parable of the lost son or what some translations call the prodigal, you'll see how, you'll see the compassion of God. You'll see his compassion there, his tenderness, the way that he was suffering with the son the whole time that the son was lost. In all of his lostness, the, the father was right there agonizing that's not that was not his desire for his son uh, that was for for the son in the in the story it's not his desire for us that we would be in our lostness that we would be in the pit uh, he created us for more than that and he is compassionate he is compassionate again you know it, it talks about him finding us in the pit and quite honestly uh, many of us got in the pit on our own it wasn't like we were walking uh, along, uh, most of us, in, in righteousness and holiness, and, uh, and, and somehow we just got scooped up and tossed into the pit. Most of us got there on our own, and yet we see the compassion and the grace of our great God. He is compassionate, He is gracious, He is slow to anger. Well, praise God that He is slow to anger, amen? I mean, I would have wadded us up and thrown us away a long time ago. He is slow to anger. And he is abounding in love, just overflowing in love. Verses nine, uh, 9 and 10 remind us that he is merciful. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. And so he's not just simmering. He's not just stewing in his righteous anger, right? I mean, he is just, and uh, we've talked about that, he is just, he does what is right in all ways, and so if that which is right, that is punishment for sin, he is perfectly just in that, okay? But, but he's not just uh, holding up the storehouse of, uh, of anger, he's just not just simmering, and, and one day that we have to worry that God's just going to snap, uh, that's not God. That's not God. He will not always accuse, nor really harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Oh, in fact, if you were to look in Isaiah chapter 53, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Jesus. Oh, indeed, he does not treat us according to what our sins deserve. He is merciful. If we press on into verse 11, uh, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Unfathomable love, which I, I realized after I said that, I guess when we think of fathoms, we often think of the deep, right? So perhaps a, a poor choice of words there, but but his love, we cannot reach the depths of it as high as the heavens are above the earth. So great is his love for those who fear him. Uh, and he is indeed awe-inspiring. Awe-inspiring. So not awesome in the sense of, well, that was a really cool trick that your dog just did. 
uh, or, or wow, hey, uh, nice deer, that's awesome. We throw awesome around, but I mean, I mean truly, he is awe-inspiring, as high as the heavens are above the earth. That's pretty grand, friends. That's pretty grand. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Now, keep in mind, uh, so I have this simply, uh, on verse 12, simply described God as the rebellion remover. Uh, that's because transgressions are, are flat-out acts of rebellion against the known law of God. So they're not things we just kind of stumble in, or maybe we're a little careless, maybe uh, we just you know, weren't all in and we missed the mark, uh, which is a general definition for sin. No, when we read transgressions, that's, that's uh, the sin of, of a rebellious nature. We knew the law of God. Uh, we knew what he expected. We knew what he wanted from us, and we just flat out rebelled against it. <clears throat> Look at this. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Our acts of blatant rebellion, he has removed from us. As far as the east is from the west, I, I know that so many times uh, since I've been pastoring here, I've, I've shared the illustration, not going to really go into it now, but just consider this, east and west never meet. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our acts of rebellion from us. And as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He is a compassionate father. I do realize that some of you had, had uh, less than desirable dads, and my heart aches when I think about that. Shoot, my heart aches when I think of... Uh, the times when I really drop the ball as a dad to my own girls. But if you could think about the best dad ever, on the best day ever, that's the Father God. As a father has compassion on his children. And so he's not one who's gloating over our, our misdeeds. He's not one who's gloating over our sin. He's not one who is, uh, you've heard that old expression, uh, hey, this is going to hurt you a lot more than it hurts me. You know, when a dad is just gloating, okay, you've had this coming, here it comes. No, 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 the scripture says, as a father has compassion for his children. So the Father, the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Oh, what a tender, compassionate God we serve. He has compassion. Hey, so listen, uh, listen. Do you remember when you were a kid, perhaps you, you kind of stepped in something and rather going back to dad, you, you just decided you were going to run from the reality? And Do you remember when he found out on his own? Do you remember how that went? <laughs> well, I would really encourage you Friends, listen, if you found yourself far from God, if you found your, your behavior completely unbecoming a believer, first off, he's not going to find that out because he already knows that he knows all things. But he is a compassionate father to whom we can go. Don't put it off. Run to the arms of your father, okay? He is a compassionate father. And he is the one who truly knows us he knows how we're formed and remembers what we're dust, guys. Every speck of us, every speck of us, every cell, every building block of every cell, he knows completely. All right? He knows how we're formed. He remembers that we're dust. And he has compassion on us. And, and here's a beautiful thing. As for man... In verses 15 and 16, we're reminded of the frailty, frailty of our own human lives. But then verse 17 says, No, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. 
from eternity past uh, through uh, clear through the present to eternity future uh, so there is no end that long the Lord's love is with those who fear him from everlasting so so we are here but for a vapor and but listen remember the soul of man is immortal and so it's a really beautiful thing that the love of God is everlasting that it's not something he's like, okay, well, I'll kind of love on you guys for a little bit here, and then I'm just going to be so glad I'm done with you. It's not that. The soul of man is immortal, and the love of God is everlasting. It is with those who fear him, his righteousness with the children's children, and with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his promises. He is the God of the covenant. He is the original promise keeper. Verse 19 reminds us that the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. That God is sovereign. God is sovereign and it's kind of interesting. I've, I've heard in recent days some people have all sorts of ideas of what sovereign means. God is sovereign over all. God is sovereign over all. And so, uh, so friends, truly there is no one higher to whom we can appeal. No one higher to whom we can appeal. He has established his throne in heaven. He threw out the riffraff, if you recall, that, that, uh, that Lucifer cast down, right? And a third of the angels in heaven fell with him. Um, God established his throne. He is greater than all. He is, he is established. He is solid. Nothing can shake him. Uh, when, when the world has gone crazy, nothing can shake him. Which is why, by the way, we find such great, uh, such grace, great joy in knowing that it's like, no, I'm hidden in him. I'm hidden in him. Because he has established his throne, his kingdom rules over all. Which, by the way, and that may be just a good reminder for you, his kingdom rules over all. It's his, it's his kingdom. It's his world. He calls the shots. One day, if not today, one day you will bow before him. I, why not now? Why not now? His kingdom rules over all, friends. And then the passage goes on to say, hey, listen, then, so praise the Lord, you his angels. You mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all of his heavenly hosts, you servants who do his will. And we're reminded, it's like, oh, that's right. He is Lord Sabaoth. He is the commander of legions of angels. They do his bidding. And so, uh, so friends, when we think about indeed, when we think about his kindness, we think about his goodness, we think about his eternal nature, we think about his power, his majesty, his holiness, all of that then we're reminded that, no, he, he is great, and he is greatly to be praised. And so, friends, I just want to encourage you. Now, you might be thinking, wait, so that's it? You just wrapped it all up in one psalm? Uh, no, I would encourage you to keep on reading into Psalm 104, because uh, David is not done extolling the virtues of this Most High God. But, but listen, uh, for our time today, we're... We're, we're wrapping up here with prayer, but I just want to encourage you, spend time in the Word. Again, last week I talked about Psalm 103 through 107. I encourage you to read Job 38 to 41. I encourage you to look at Deuteronomy 8. There are so many other places in Scripture uh, to which we can turn to be reminded of why in the world we want to give Him thanks. But give Him thanks, friends. Praise the Lord everywhere in his dominion. And praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Father God, we do praise you this morning. We thank you for your great kindness to us. We praise you, God, uh, indeed, as we look at that. Our, our minds are still spinning when we just think about all of your deeds, all of your works, giving you praise for all of those, thanking you, Lord, with coming before you with a thankful heart. In relation to all that you've done, our minds are still spinning about that. And then we turn to this passage today that reminds us of who you are. And, and God, as we prepare to head into this Advent season, this is truly mind-blowing. 
It's going to take a lot, Lord, for us to wrap our heads around what we have just read. We're counting on your Holy Spirit to bring it back to our remembrance. We're counting on, uh, we're counting on your Holy Spirit bringing our hearts to life in the hearing of it. And God, I do pray then that we would indeed meditate upon your word. And, and as we grow to know you more, God, to praise you with every breath within us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, listen, friends, I do thank you again for tuning in. Great to have you with us. Give thanks to the Lord. He is good indeed. Amen? Amen.